them. And this is the tragedy. I mean, I'm going back to the, the idea why politics doesn't have a vision of the future, is if you live in a world of individuals where everyone is encouraged to believe that what they feel and what they want and what they desire is the centre of the world, which is the pretty much, I believe, the ideology of our time, that it's very difficult to conceive of anything beyond your own death. And it's very difficult now, and I think that's one of the things that the left has real problems with, is how do you hurt a bunch of narcissistic piglets who want to have their own death? <laughs> yeah? yeah? I mean, it's, it sounds silly, but it's sort of true. The, 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 that's why politicians find it very difficult to create collective movements, because everyone is running squealing following their own desires and the one people that who can manage it are uh, social media like facebook because you all believe that you are a little piglet doing exactly what you want when in fact the algorithms are say are actually saying actually hang on all those piglets look exactly alike and we can tell them what to do uh, yet the piglets yet the piglets feel that they are still individuals which is just brilliant they've squared the circle in a way that politicians can't well, Adam, uh, one of the one of the funny things that's happened in in the last month or so since the election of Donald Trump has been this panic in the liberal media about fake news and the spread of fake stories on social media networks, especially Facebook, as somehow altering the outcome of what other was would have been a different election. And to me, it seems like something out of one of your movies. This weird kind of meta panic about fake news by fake news people well i mean I, come on the, there's been lots of fake news way before this i mean what was what weapons of mass destruction yeah right i i, I have real problems with this i the, the, my real problem with this is it's so patronizing to those who voted for, for donald trump because basically what it's saying is if only they'd been told the real things then of course they wouldn't but they're <laughs> stupid people and they could they didn't really know what was going on because they can't tell the difference between truth and reality whereas of course we can well, no, you can't because you didn't see the <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm fed up with this amongst... Uh, it, there's a certain bunch of liberals who just go, oh, my God, the, stu the stupids are now in control. No, they're not. You're stupid. You lost the election. <laughs> of course, the, the point about the internet is that it does have a load of weird stuff on it. Yes, it does. It's the best thing about it. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say... I ha my vision of the internet is that it's rapidly becoming like, do you remember all those 1980s um, movies set in decaying city centers like Escape from New York and things like Robocop. that? Robocop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they Robocop and all those sort of things. And there, there are always m weird, mad people in sort of post-goth outfits, <laughs> in decaying factories. There's a lot of firepower. And it's just, it's exciting and fun and weird and frightening. And everyone else has moved to the suburbs. And my view of the internet is that that's exactly what it's about to become. It's going to become this strange swamp that you go into where everyone sensible has left. <laughs> and, and they're reading their books. But if you really want to go and have fun, you go into this world where you don't know what is true and what is true. <laughs> Can I just say, no, I do think that the, 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 the liberals who, who, who go on about post-truth at the moment have got to look back at 2003 and say that was all post-truth the whole thing and they all went along with that too at the time and most of them including those who sort of didn't like the invasion believed it yeah yeah and that's post-truth and that is so much more important so to squeak about post-truth at this stage without seeing the much more important roots of how politicians lied to them again and again and again over the last six or seven years is, I don't know, it's again an example of the left retreating into a simplified world. They go, oh, it's all not really real. So therefore, Donald Trump's not really real. No, it's not like that. Donald Trump and the dissatisfaction that, that his, the votes for him came from come from things like 2003. It's not because they read some little fake news on some news feed on Facebook. It's because... In 2003, and then in 2008 with the banks, the politicians lied and failed to do anything. That led to a people turning away from politicians and not trusting them, and they deserve it. Adam, if you if you do an, your next movie, I don't know if you're working on anything, but uh, just a documentary about Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign would include all of these themes yeah, magnificently. It would be the most comprehensive look at the psychosis of our time. <laughs> I mean, so if I take you, what you're saying is you, you, you distrust these, you think the liberals are refusing to face up to why they lost, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. They yeah. totally succumb to all these fantasies. They're wrapped around in 
in yeah, blaming the Russians or blaming the FBI or the America's innate racism. Uh, they can't they can't face the essential disconnect between the Democratic Party and the American electorate. No, no, I agree. I mean, I had I got into trouble here with so-called liberal friends, where I just say, look, people like Donald Trump and Brexit. Well, actually, just take Donald Trump. Donald Trump is what in uh, learned circles is called a comedic character. He is a giant vaudeville distorted figure who is showing you the liberals what kind of society you have created and for the last 30 years you have been living a lovely life but out there there is something else and you have ignored it completely and utterly and you have lied to it and you have let it down uh you know weapons of mass destruction did have a big effect in my country and i'm sure it did in yours it, it went quite deep liberals they really hate it they cannot do deal with it because what what it shows is is you have created a society in which you don't actually believe in anything any longer this is more sort of what i was trying to say so gently in hyper normalization is that is the problem with the liberals and that the whole middle that genteel middle class it's not just liberals is they don't actually believe in anything any longer and that's the real problem and there's a guy i quote at the end of um uh, hypernormalization, who is a guy called uh, Abu Mas Musab al-Suri, the Syrian. He's a terrorist, you journalists would call it mastermind, but he's a terrorist here <laughs> from, from, from Syria, um, whose writings in the last five or six years have inspired many of what are called the lone wolf attacks uh, in Europe. And what al-Suri says is, look, don't bother with politicians because they don't have any moral authority any longer. Um, don't have a big organization because you'll just get bombed shit by uh, America, which is what happened to bin Laden. He's very critical of bin Laden's organization in, in, in Afghanistan. Um, and what you do is you go for the liberal middle classes. And the reason is, he says in this very long book, uh, is they don't believe in anything any longer. So they, well, you can frighten them. And I think that's where we are at the moment. And if I could come back to the Soviet Union in the 1980s, if you live in a world where you know that everything is all a bit wrong and all a bit fake, and that when you get sacked from your nice job in the media, what you then go and do is take the payoff money and invest it in Airbnb, uh, in, in flats that you can, apartments that you can rent on Airbnb, uh, and that, and you're living off that, you, you know it's all a bit odd, but there isn't anything else. But underneath it, you know that you don't believe in anything, and you also know that the politicians who represent you don't believe in anything. What I found most sad, not just about the Hillary Clinton campaign, but also about when I watched the Occupy movement and I watched those meetings, they didn't believe in anything. They had no picture of a world they wanted to create. What they had a picture was, was of a system of how to manage groups. Yeah? And they yeah. confused yeah, that's true. process. They confuse process with idealism. And that's also true of your second category of uh, people who believe in algorithms as the solution to the future. Because what they say is, if only the system of delivery of information was efficient, then everything would be all right. What they ignore is they've got absolutely nothing to say in that system of information. Yeah? Yeah, no, that's true. Here's a picture of, of, of my dog yesterday looking a little more different from the day before. <laughs> yeah, uh, like Occupy, <laughs> Occupy it, it really did feel like they felt that just getting everybody together and having the discussion would at some point in the future lead to something. But uh, but like that that's putting the way that uh, collective organization and change happens exactly in the wrong direction. Like you have to start from a premise. Yes, you have to have an idea and you have to inspire people and you have to have something you imagine. What they, they've confused it, they've become, they became the very thing they were trying to fight against, managers. That's what they were. They were like breakout groups in large corporate. <laughs> Trust falls. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and that, that was the real problem. And, and, and it's, it is funny and it's absurd and it's silly, but it's also deeply tragic. And I think underneath it all is that both the left and the right, partly driven by Silicon Valley, but not completely, 
have bought into this utilitarian, rational mode of thinking, which is that everything can be measured, processed, and, and, and the outcomes can be predicted. It's a sort of managerial techno technocracy. And the left went for it because they, they ran out of ideas. The trouble is it's a dead end. It, the way you change the world is by having a vision of a future. The last people who did it were actually Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher. They had a vision of the world. Um, and it, their vision of a world was of a world in which politics would, would retreat. But it was a vision. And since then, there hasn't been anything. And what, why it's so tragic about the left? I mean, the, I, in the film, I talk about Tahir Square, which is a much even more dramatic example of... Um, uh, of Occupy, is you had this vast movement called out by social media. And social media is very good at organizing people. I mean, I mustn't knock it for that. It's really good at, it's good at process. It's good at managing. And it managed to get everyone out there. They got to Tahir Square. They toppled beautifully and brilliantly this vicious dictator who'd been supported by Britain and America for 30 years. And then they looked at each other and they thought, well, what do we do now? And none of them knew. And the one group that did have an idea, the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood, who are a nasty bunch of right-wing reactionary Islamists, swept into that vacuum and seized power. At which point, those liberal revolutionaries turned back to the generals and said, please, please get rid of these nasty Islamists. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go and shoot them. And, the, and really, literally, there were groups saying, yes, please do go and shoot Adam, them. Adam, I, I see shit. I see shit from liberals in this country now who are doing the same. They're pining for a deep state coup against Donald Trump. Yeah. They're hoping that the CIA is going to overthrow him like it's Central America in the 80s or something. They're not. I, I, sw just... I swear to God, I've seen people oh, maybe yeah. half kidding, but the, the, the thought is certainly there. No, I've seen people... Say like very seriously, you know, uh, patriotic people in our in our government need to realize the threat that Trump poses and stand up and show that they're really concerned about the Constitution by overthrowing the president. Really? Oh yeah, <laughs> we have uh, we have some particularly depraved liberals in this country. <laughs> <laughs> well, during the Sanders uh, insurgency, there was a, a guy uh, Chuck Lane who's a the editorial page. Uh, he was the editorial page. Uh, leader of the Washington Post, who was basically kind of craving a Pinochet to come along and take care of the Allende that was that was Bernie Sanders. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it is funny and it's absurd, but th there is also a serious thing on, behind all this, is that there is obviously a deep desire to actually make things better and that over the last 30 years certain very powerful groups in my country and in your country have effectively taken hold of power i mean above all finance but uh, increasingly that they're fusing with elements fr from the technocracy of silicon valley and of managerial systems i was going to say i'm glad you brought up this that, that this idea that there is a very intense desire for change or for something different and you talk about tragedy and and really all of your films you do, you do, you document this tragedy where pe people again and again, they want to get away from hierarchy, from power, from these old ways of domination and control. But they always invariably end up recreating the same thing over and over and over again. And you state that one of the features of living in a kind of post-political world is this failure of imagination to imagine a better world. So I guess in closing, how, how, how will we know, or it, is there a way of telling that, what would it look like to imagine a different world, I guess is what I'm asking. Do you have a vision of it? Or, I mean, not to put everything on you, Adam, please save us, but how would we know that we're beginning to imagine a different world, even within this hyper real one? You asked what real change might look like. And I think it's a really, I mean, that is a really interesting question for liberals and radicals, because there is a hunger for change out there among millions of people who feel sort of insecure, uncertain about the future, and do want something, do want that to change. I think that change only comes through a big imaginative idea, a sort of picture of another kind of future, which gives people a, which connects with that fearfulness in the back of people's minds and offers them a release from it that's the key thing but i think the, the question for liberals and radicals is that the, 
they are always suspicious of big ideas. That's what lurks underneath the liberal mindset. And the reason is, and, and they're quite right in a way, is, is look what happened last time when millions of people got swept up in a big idea. Look at the last hundred years at what happened in Russia and then in Germany. The point is, is that change, political change is frightening. It's scary. It's thrilling because it is dynamic and it's doing something to change the world. But it is scary because it can change things in ways where nothing is secure. It's like being in an earthquake. Even the solid ground underneath you begins to move and things dissolve that you think are solid and real. And I think that the question liberals and the left have to face at the moment is a really sort of difficult question, which is, do you really want change? Do you really want it? Because if you do, many of them might find themselves in a very uncertain world where they might lose all sorts of things. They, I mean, what we're talking about in many cases is people who are the, sort of at the centre of society at the moment. They're not out of the margins. They would have a lot to lose from real political change because it really would change things in the structure of power. Or, and this is the brutal question, do you just want things to change a little bit? Do you just want the banks to be a little bit nicer, say? Or people to be a little more respectful of each other's identities? All of which is good. But basically, you carry on living in a nice world where you tinker with it. Those, that's the key question. <laughs> but you can't just sit there forever worrying about big ideas because there are millions of people out there who do want change. And the key thing is, they feel they've got nothing to lose. You might have lots to lose, but they feel they've got absolutely nothing to lose. But at the moment, they're being led by the right. So things won't remain the same, but society may go off in ways that you really don't want. So what you, what I think, I mean, in answer to your question, what you need is a powerful vision of the future with all its dangers, but it's also quite thrilling it would be an escape from the staticness of the world that we have today. And to do that, you've got to engage with the giant forces of power that now run the world at the moment. You might, and the, and the key, but the key thing is, is in confronting those powers and trying to, to transform the world, you might lose a lot. This is a sort of forgotten idea, is that actually you surrender yourself up to a big idea. And in the process, you might lose something but you'd actually gain in a bigger sense because you'd change the world for the better. And I know it sounds soppy, but sort of this is the forgotten thing about politics, is that you give up some of your individualism to something bigger than yourself. You surrender yourself, and it's a lost idea. And I think, really in answer to your question, is you can spot real change happening when you see people from the liberal middle classes beginning to give themselves up to something surrender themselves for something bigger than themselves and at the moment there is nothing like that in the liberal imagination. Okay, 